My name is Frances Preston and I hope you enjoyed that bit of Telemann. Bass quartet, bit unusual, but I thought you'd enjoy something a little bit different. So I'm here today to talk to you about the double bass. This is my Baroque bass and I want to talk to you about the difference between this and my modern bass, which is actually about 300 years old. So maybe not so modern, but it's all about the kind of music that I play on it, which is why we call it a modern bass. So, main differences. The strings, so I've got four gut strings here. They're made from cow guts. They're treated properly, don't worry. And these two bottom ones are wrapped in silver. Whereas on a modern bass, you've got synthetic material wrapped in steel, which is definitely stronger, produces a louder sound. So, strings, obviously big difference. Uh, we've got G, D, A, Baroque bass, well I like to play with the, that string formation, but on my modern bass we have G, <laughs> different pitch, G, D, A and C because I have this special bit on top which is called an extension and it just gives me the extra notes at the bottom. Okay, and the other difference we have, this bow, which is my Baroque bow, you can also get un underhanded ones which are quite like viol, ga uh, viol bows, I think. Like the viol de gambas, they play like this. But also the Germans play like this. Whereas my modern bow, it's a French bow, which is uh, wh why we play like this. This is a French bow hold rather than a German one like this. The German bows would be a lot bigger as well, just to help with that. Uh, so you can see this modern bow is a lot bigger and has a lot more hair, also helping us to produce a lot more sound. Okay, so those are the main differences between the two instruments. And uh, nowadays, I would actually say the biggest importance between a modern and a Baroque bass is actually just having an awareness and a sensitivity to the kind of music that you're playing and which period it comes from. So, as an example of this, I chose a little snippet from pretty much my favourite aria from Handel's Messiah, and it's called O Thou That Tellest Good Tidings to Zion, uh, sung by Alto, which at the time would definitely have been sung, I think, by a man. So this is where, you know, it shows that you really have to understand who's singing and what kind of sensitivity you have to play with because if it's a man it's going to be slightly lighter in tone than a female voice funnily enough uh, so where you'll hopefully notice the difference of my playing between it on the gut strings on the period bass and when I play it on the modern so here we go <laughs> seconds and I'll play it on my modern. It's a little bit heavier.
mean, I was enjoying it a little bit too much at the end there. It's very rare that we actually get to play these bottom notes, especially in Baroque music. But when we do, it's quite nice. Let's have a quick look at the history of the double bass. We're going to start about 500 years ago in Italy, uh, where the bass line would have been re really played on a bass violin rather than on what we would see today. Tracing the history of the instrument is actually quite tricky because there's actually no standardised design, no standardised size or tuning. Even now, in 2021, there's a huge, huge range of instruments and sizes. I think the key point to what makes a bass is the octave that we play at, which is known as 16 foot. And it's, that's in relation to the organ and the fact that what we play comes out a pi uh, an octave lower than what's written on the page. Big step for us towards the instrument that you would see today uh, was made by Silvestro Ganassi in 1542. He made an instrument um, which was still in the style of a viola da gamba. Um, but he made the sloping shoulders that we see. Um, this instrument still had six strings and it was still at eight foot pitch, which is um, what the cellos of today play at. But it was definitely a lot closer to what we have now for the double bass. I want to return to the fact that up until even as late as the 1920s, the number and tuning of the strings was never really standardised or settled. Often, basses had three strings. Uh, these strings were tuned in such a way that it was easier to play chords. We call this now Viennese tuning, and it gives the instrument a more powerful sound, actually. Uh, it allows it to be a bit more soloistic, project better. Um, there are composers who wrote specifically for this. Uh, they are the likes of Dittstorff, Sperger and Van Hull. We don't really see Viennese tuning too much these days. Um, I personally don't think I would manage, but there are some people who specialise in this playing and this string formation. Big step for us as double bass instruments was in the 17th century, and that was the wrapping of those lower two strings which are still at this point cow intestines. Uh, but then, in, as I said, in the 17th century, they discovered that they could wrap these guts in copper. Now, this meant that the agility of the bass player was increased. Uh, we didn't have to hold notes or just sit on the lower note of the chord. We could actually move around and it didn't sound terrible. <laughs> However, of course, with any great invention comes new problems. So that new problem was that this new binding caused great attention on the peg box, which is where we tune the instrument. Um, big problem, because of course, if you think of how a violin peg, they stick out, and that's exactly how it used to be for us where you'd have to use brute force almost to get the peg to change position. You can imagine the difficulty. This was thankfully fixed in 1778 by a German violin maker who's called Karl Ludwig Bachmann. And he created the screw mechanism peg box that you would see on a modern bass. So then from the 1830s, four string double basses were introduced. These instruments were much more mellow than the three stringed relatives, but I think the resonance was much preferred over the harsher, slightly, slightly harsher tones of the three strings instruments. The number of instruments in the orchestra to compensate for this mellow, slightly quieter sound, uh, it was increased, so you'd find at least three, maybe four, basses in every single orchestra. Um, composers really liked it because it, you know, you use the bass sound to fill the hall and hold the rhythm. It's like a beating heart of the orchestra. 
There is a composer I want to briefly return to, as he cannot go unmentioned. Um, so up until 1803, the role of the bass was to play the same line as the cello, underpinning the harmony and the rhythm. Now, this composer, maybe you know, is Beethoven. He was the first to use the bass in its own right, and he created a completely separate bass line from the cello uh, in his third symphony, which is called the Eroica. I think that this was because in 1799, Beethoven met a bass player and composer called Domenico Dragonetti. They spoke at length about the possibilities of the bass and how it just wasn't used enough at all. Uh, and he proved this to Beethoven by performing Beethoven's own cello sonata in G minor, and he performed it on the bass, not on the cello. <laughs> and it was great, I'm sure. <laughs> so since then, Dragonetti would actually often tour with Beethoven, and he was known as Beethoven's virtuosi bass player. I think Beethoven definitely wrote his recits in the Ninth Symphony for Dragonetti. Uh, as I said, Dragonetti also wrote his own music, um, including some waltzes, which I'm going to play for you now. Here is number six. <laughs> time a little and talk about Berlioz. Berlioz loved the bass but it was not enough for him so he created the octa bass which is really quite a monster. It has three strings but the pitch is two octaves lower than the cello and an octave lower than a modern bass is today. Now it required two people to play. One person would stand on a platform and press levers which would hold down the strings and the other person to bow. It's not the best solution to playing low, as you can imagine. So in 1880, around about, they created five string basses and obviously the four string bass with the extension, which is what I have on my modern bass. 
the five string, it has a bottom string which goes as low as a B. Now, if you can imagine how low this is, to cope with the tension, the instrument has to be a bit bigger and the fingerboard has to be also quite a lot bigger. Someone with my hands, for example, would find that very difficult to play because it's just so big. Now, strangely, I'm not really sure why, but the Germans seem to prefer the five string bass, whereas you're more likely to find a four string bass with an extension made in England. Now, we return to strings. The gut strings were still used up until the early 20th century, but then they created the strings that we have these days, which are synthetic and wrapped in silver or in steel. And these strings just gave us more agility, even more. Uh, sort of opened the door, really, truly. Um, great attention, which meant that the projection was better, so we could be louder. And uh, it allowed us to really sustain the pitches, uh, which is why composers such as Mahler and Strauss really create these beautiful cushions at the bottom of the orchestra with the bass. Now, in the last 30 to 40 years, the bass has continued to develop even more, but we're now heading towards the soloistic side. Uh, as the instruments are changing, the, we're creating the mini bass, which means that kids as young as five can take up the bass now, which means that they're getting so good, so young, uh, and there's just so much more repertoire now because people can actually play it, which is wonderful. Um, the mini bass is a very interesting topic, but it's for another time, I think. So I'm gonna leave you now with some Vivaldi. Uh, in fact, his Sonata number no. three, um, titled Paris. Uh, and actually I chose Vivaldi because this is his birthday month. I hope you enjoy.